Okay, thank you for coming today. Um, I'd like to start off my talk with a seemingly completely random pop quiz. So, just shout out if you know the answer. Who, who discovered the theory of natural selection? Darwin. So everyone yelled Darwin. This worked perfectly. What most people don't remember is that while Darwin did discover natural selection, independently, Alfred Russell Wallace also came up with the same theory at about the same time, which just lent further support to the theory. So I've titled my talk Luminance Forestry Reclamation Approach, and the analogy I'd like to draw here is that Jim Berger and other folks uh, who've worked in the Appalachian region developing the five steps of the FRA for the last several decades are Darwin, and the folks working at Luminant in East Texas are Wallace in this analogy, in that they've been trying to do good mineland reclamation, they've been trying to do good silviculture with the forest that they're reclaiming, and relatively independently, they've come to many of the same conclusions and many of the same processes that folks here in the Appalachian region have arrived at through the FRA. And I, I hope to illustrate that with some data we've collected today. Now, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors here, Dean Koval, Hans Williams, and Brian Oswald are all my colleagues at Stephen F. Austin. And the work I'll be presenting today was done by and large by Jeremy Priest, who's a master's student working with me right now. And he'll be defending his thesis, uh, which you'll see the results of here today, in two weeks uh, from tomorrow. So when I say the work we did, Jeremy was the one out there with the chainsaw and the shovel. Okay, a little quick background. Uh, Dan Dar is here from Luminant and will be giving a talk right after lunch today in this session on more of Luminant's practices in East Texas. So I'll just go over a very brief introduction, but there's a fairly typical operation uh, for dragline mining of lignite coal in this coal belt here you see in eastern and central Texas. Uh, we're on the coastal plain, the upper coastal plain, so you have relatively flat undulating topography. There's a major difference you'll notice in this photo from what we saw on the tour on Tuesday. There's no rocks in that photo. Uh, our overburden burden is primarily a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, and in the West Gulf Coastal Plain in Texas in this region, our forests are subject to a lot of prolonged droughts. Many of you may have seen in the national media in 2011, Texas had 4 million acres burn in wildland fires as a result of a severe drought. Um, so we get some very intense droughts. Average rainfall is about 40 to 50 inches, but we have some years where we don't really approach that average. Now, Luminant uh, practices a, a number of different post-mining land uses. They have pastures. Uh, they have hardwood plantations that are going to be much more similar to what we see in the Appalachian region that are primarily intended for wildlife habitat use, where it's a mixture of native hardwood species. But what I'll be talking about today is their timber land use, which is primarily planted Lavalle pine plantations. Uh, that you see here. These are photos that are some of uh, Jeremy's actual study plots. Um, we got a good introduction from uh, Elizabeth Hansen this morning on La Valle Pine. Um, it is native to this region in East Texas. And just to give you a sense of the scale of La Valle's importance to productivity in the, the southeastern coastal plain, uh, we've got about 35 million acres of La Valle Pine planted as of today. That's larger in area than the state of Pennsylvania. Um, as of today, you know, the housing market is fairly depressed, so we're only planting about 800 million trees a year. Uh, that's down from a high in the mid-90s when the housing market was stronger of 1.6 billion seedlings a year. And this is all primarily by private industry, private landowners. Um, there's very little federal land in this region, so it, it's all private planting. One other thing you'll notice in this plantation is not much competition. This is very similar to the study plots we saw on the field tour with Lavalle here in Kentucky. Um, so if you look, step five of the FRA, plant your trees right. These are well-planted trees. 1-0 stock adapted to the region. You know, if you look at step four of the FRA, get the right species selection. If timber management is the landowner objective, which it is on these properties, you're going to be hard-pressed to pick a better native species than Lavalle pine. So they're already hitting some of these steps of the FRA as we know it in the Appalachian. Now, you've already seen this uh, this morning with uh, Kara Dallaire's talk, and I'll talk about site index some more, uh, but this is Jim Berger's figure from the Wedge study where he's looking at site index and how that relates to value of timber production. And so this is what we wanted to do um, on these luminant study sites. You know, in, in Texas, there's no productivity standard for forests. You have to have 450 live trees in the ground uh, for bond release. And 
break or are, are not a productivity standard. So we wanted to look at productivity. We've, we've noticed some subtle differences sort of anecdotally and in previous research projects at a young age, but we now have rotation length data to actually look at productivity from both a site index standpoint and from a biomass productivity standpoint, what we'll be doing in this project. So here are our research questions. Are these stands as productive as they were prior to mining? Are they, these stands as productive as stands on non-mine land? And as the tree biomass develops, is it developing in a similar manner to what we would expect on non-mine land? We had some major advantages working with lava like pine in this area. We didn't put in any control plots on non-mine land because there's literally dozens and dozens of studies that have great data in the literature that we can use to establish how lava like pine grows and how site index works on non-mine land. So we use the literature as a control. So here are the, the study sites that Jeremy used. He used 48 plots on Luminance Beckville uh, mine and 24 on their Oak Hill mine, which are all a little bit southeast of Dallas, uh, near Henderson or, or Tyler, Texas, if you're familiar with the region. And these are what the two mines look like. Here's Beckville on the left and Oak Hill on the right. Now the reclamation practices are slightly different on these two mines. Beckville is replaced with what they call mixed overburden. There's no attempt to remove topsoil and replace it, but that's done based on Pat Angel's thesis work when he was funded under a Illuminate Environmental Research Fellowship at Stephen F. Austin um, in the 70s. So there's good data that we don't need to do that on Beckville because the chemical properties of the mine spoil are sufficient for pasture and tree growth. On the right, Oak Hill, it's a little different. Uh, at Oak Hill, there are issues with acidity due to pyrite um, in the mine spoil. So there, they do replace the, the topsoil. And so it's a four-foot haulback. So there's step one of the FRA. Use an appropriate mine spoil. Um, and step two, four feet, right? So we've replaced about four feet deep. I don't want to overemphasize step two because there's still a lot more we need to understand about compaction um, on these sites uh, to get a better handle on how that may um, affect productivity. So here are more photos of Jeremy's study plots. Uh, what he did is he went in and he got some basic stand data in a 20 meter by 50 meter plot. It's about a 10 hectare quarter acre. Uh, he measured every tree. Uh, you can see that's fairly easy to do on these plots um, compared to traditional timber cruising. Uh, there's very little competing vegetation out there. And then what he did is he went and he selected the 10 largest dominant and co-dominant trees um, out of the plot and he randomly selected one of those to destructively harvest. And we went with one of the dominant and co-dominant trees because those are the trees site index should be measured on. Because what you're trying to get with site index is an estimate of productivity of that site, and you can't do that if you're looking at a tree in a lower crown class that's been suppressed. That's not giving you a real estimation of the productivity of the site. He went with the, one of the 10 largest because we wanted to see what the potential productivity on this site was. How well could trees grow? And so here's some of the destructive harvest work. Um, across those 72 sites, they ranged in age from 2 to 32 years old. We stratified by age class. So we had a wide range of age classes, and 25 is a typical rotation length for lava and pine plantation. So we had a full rotation chrono sequence. For some of the small trees, he just used lopping shears or hand saws, and we harvested the whole tree. This was the largest tree in the study, about 72 feet tall, about 32 years. Um, and so we felled it with a chainsaw. And there's Jason Grogan, one of our research associates, um, cutting it up into four-foot sections. From the top of each four-foot section, we took a tree cookie, about two inches uh, in cross-section there. And so there you can see a 72-foot-tall pine tree condensed down to about three feet by taking a cookie out every four feet. Count the growth rings on there, and you can use a process called stem analysis to build site index curves. So what Jeremy did is parameterize site index curves to the pines on these mine lands. I don't have photos. He also did below ground harvest on 12 trees. On four of those, he tried to get the entire tap root. So he went a meter in diameter, a meter deep, and then he dug another half meter on those four trees that were most intensively sampled. And then below that, we removed the rest of the tap root with an excavator. Um, he got 12 root systems total, and that's split up by age class. On the other eight root systems, he only went a meter deep, and we used the deeper plots to scale that to a full depth. So we have below ground data as well. He also put in one meter diameter, half meter deep coarse root pits stratified into 10 centimeter horizons. And again, on four of those plots, he went down to a meter so we could scale that to deeper depth to make sure we thought we had an estimate of about 95% of the total root volume. We weighed the whole trees green in the field. 
so that we could bring subsamples back to the lab and use those subsamples, oven dry them, and scale all this up to a full tree basis. Then use our stand data to scale all it up to a area basis. So we've got this data on, on a bunch of different levels depending on what scaling we're doing. Now we ran into a problem with our site index estimation. Uh, we didn't have good pre-mining site index data on these stands, so we used the soil survey just like Kara talked about this morning. Um, the problem with doing that for lava like pine is when you go to web soil survey, it's giving you 50 year base age curves for naturally regenerated pine stands developed by Coyle and Schumacher in North Carolina in the 1950s. Well, in a modern lava like pine plantation, you use a 25 year site index age. And so I've been using this technique in silviculture. I sort of just made it up. There's no good data to support it. But what I did is we, we took the 50 year curves. We found where that particular, uh, you know, level was based on the soil survey. We followed them back to age 25 and then arbitrarily added 10 feet. And that 10 feet is to account for the fact that these are now plantations. They're not natural stands. Uh, tree improvement is on its third or fourth cycle, depending on where you are in the south. But that's adding height growth. We're using better silviculture, better planting techniques, better competition control, better fertilizer. So that 10 feet is to account for gains in site index that we're seeing due to silviculture. Like I said, it's arbitrary. Well, what we did to back this up, we went and looked in the literature. We found another technique to do this, where you take the 50-year age, uh, multiply it by two-thirds, and add seven. We tried that compared to this. And Eric Taylor uh, with Texas A&M Forest Service uh, just used some data from Dean Coble that he's been collecting in East Texas and figured out how to go from age 50 to age 25 based on the real data. And out of all three of those methods, this method produced the highest estimates of site index. So we went with it. It's probably overestimating site index a little, but that's what we wanted. Because if we've got today's site index on the mine land here, and we've got our estimate of pre-mining site index, if we overestimate it, we're not going to spuriously conclude that we've restored productivity. We want to set the bar high for ourselves. And so that's why we went with this approach. And so what we found doing this based on the soil survey, uh, the site index at Beckville Mine was 70 feet, and the site index at Oak Hill Mine was 66 feet at 25 years based on the soil survey data. And those are realistic numbers. Uh, Dean Coble's data set shows that it's at 71 feet on average in East Texas. We know these are below average sites, though. Um, there's some data from Willard and others out of Stephen F. Austin in the 80s where they didn't measure trees on these mines, but what they did is they looked at similar soil series adjacent to the mines. Site index estimates they got on real stands were between 60 and 65 feet. So we think we've done what we've tried. We, we think we've overestimated slightly the original site indices to give us a, a target to shoot for. Are there any forest biometricians in the audience? Okay, I'm in luck. Nobody. So if you've got questions about the specific model forms, I, I can answer those after, but we won't go into that. Um, here's the stem analysis results that Jeremy got, where you see the average height age model fitted to Beckville and Oak Hill mines with 95% confidence bars on it. And then you can see each of these curves made up of individual points as one of our individual sample trees. Um, and so what he found uh, is that, you know, only four trees were out of those 95% confidence intervals on Beckville. There were maybe seven out, all out the lower end on Oak Hill, but they were all younger than 16 years. We're not exactly sure why. It could have been that 2011 drought having a greater impact on the smaller trees. Um, that's just a hypothesis at this point. But he developed tight age models. He compared them, and the parameter estimates on these models were not statistically different from one another. So he created a combined reclaimed mining model that includes data from both mines. There was no reason to treat them separately. And from that, he developed site index curves. So we have site index curves now parameterized to reclaim mine land for La Valley Pine in East Texas. And uh, what you can see here, these dotted lines, East Texas unmined land, those are Dean Coble's curves. Uh, he's got hundreds of growth and yield plots that have been measured for a long time in East Texas. That's what we used as our control. So you can see they're, they're pretty similar um, on an absolute magnitude basis. Um, of the three parameters, the, the three regression coefficients, uh, the one that dictated asymptote of the curve up here was not statistically significantly different, but the other two that dictated curve shape were different. So that these curves are different from those on unmined land. When we looked at site index on the post-mining soil survey versus what we got from that soil, or sorry, when we look at pre-mining site index that we got off the soil survey and compared it to what we actually saw in these mines, 
uh, what you see is here, here's the mine land data in black, and then these open circles are the original site index. And in all cases on both mines, they fell within the 95% confidence interval. So from a statistical standpoint, there's enough variability out there, we can't tell the difference. So it's looking like uh, with Luminance uh, reclamation practices, they have restored productivity when we use site indexes later to the pre-mining site index in La Bolle Mine. Now, here's a comparison here where we didn't look at pre-mining site to index, we just looked at East Texas average, about 71 feet. And again, we know these were below average sites to start with. But even when you compare it to East Texas average, these reclaimed mineland pine plantations, they're only significantly shorter between ages 16 and 25. The rest of the ages, you can't even tell the height difference from a non-mined average site in East Texas. Um, so there, there's this short, short-term effect that we're seeing compared to an average. Now here's biomass data here. Uh, this is kilograms per tree. Um, we did a lot of that site index stuff in English units so that it would be useful for land managers. A lot of this biomass stuff we're doing in metric units so that we can make carbon sequestration comparisons. So for any grad students in the audience, there's a good example of what not to do with your units in a talk. Um, but here you see kilograms per tree. And we used a data set that came out last year from Gonzalez Baniki. Um, and what that data set is, they took Virginia Tech growth and yield co-op data. They took any study they could find where they destructively harvested Labole pine and fit biomass equations to it. And so you're looking at basically on those triangles, those represent 700 sample trees in total across the entire southeastern range of Labole pine. So a very robust, wide, widely applicable data set. These circles are both the model projection and the actual tree measurements of above ground total biomass. So this included branches, needles um, on our trees. And what you see at any given DBH, our mineland trees were a little bit bigger. They, they had a little bit more mass to them than trees on unmined lands, which was really a surprise to us. When we started breaking this down a little more and figuring out what was going on, uh, what it looks like is going on is these trees are tapering a little less, particularly when they get larger. Um, and we don't know exactly why. It could be a combination of stand density management. Density management on these stands is a little different than your average pine plantation. Um, when Jeremy looked at the Girard form class, which you typically use for a timber cruise in pine in the southern U.S. is 82, 84, 86, something like that. By about age 20, 25, these stands had a Girard form class of like 92, 94. Their diameter, 17 feet off the ground, was about 92 or 94 percent what the diameter was at the butt of the tree. So they're really not tapering much for whatever reason. Here's this below ground data. And so you can see what we'd expect. The, the root systems get larger. Um, on larger DBH trees, but the biggest tree he harvested was about a foot in diameter, 30 centimeters, and it was about 200 kilograms for the entire root system. Um, so Jeremy did a lot of work digging these out. We went, then went and looked at the allometry of the trees, basically how they're allocating their biomass above ground versus below ground, to start getting at this notion of, you know, we've got reclaimed mine spoils. This is as foreign and alien a soil as we can find for La Bolle pine to grow in within its natural range. Are they going to be doing about the same thing? And again, we use data from the literature. So all these black dots are from a 2008 paper uh, by Coyle and Coleman. And Coyle and Coleman put together basically a meta-analysis. So they took those points from about a dozen sources throughout the literature. Basically, any study that looked at root-shoot ratios in La Bolle pine at a stand scale, megagrams per hectare. Um, and so this represents the sea tree sites, if you're familiar, in North Carolina, where it's a deep, sandy soil and they have fertilizer, irrigation treatments, and massive differences in productivity. This is from King and others' work at NC State. A bunch of different studies, but it's on different soils, different fertilizer levels, different irrigation levels, different open pollinated genetics, all lava -like pine. And what Coyle and Coleman found is lava -like pine always does pretty much the same thing. If you fertilize a stand, the root shoot ratios change. But it's not because the tree allocated less to roots because it had that those nutrients available. It's because the tree grew larger, and larger trees always have different root shoot ratios than smaller trees. And so basically, whatever environment you put Labole pine in, you can alter its growth rates. But at a given size, they'll always have about the same root shoot rate. And so it's under really good what we call ontogenetic control, genetic control, developmental control. Well, I put 
Jeremy put his plots on here, these open circles, and if I zoom in a little closer, this line now represents Coyle and Coleman's regression here. And what you see when the trees are larger, this is the natural log of above ground biomass. When they're larger, they fit that regression really well. But what was kind of surprising to see when the trees are smaller, they're outside the 95% confidence interval and are best fit by a different regression. And so when you're reclaiming mine land, everyone in here knows the first few years, there's a lot of things going on there. You're restoring nitrogen cycling, you're restoring, restoring carbon cycling, organic matter, soil biota, all these different things are very different in the first few years. And over time, Brian Strom did a good job yesterday showing they get more and more similar to non-mine stands. And so it looks like early on, even the trees are doing something fundamentally different than what we really see Lavalley pine doing with their root shoot allocation. And if you look at the actual data, they're higher. And so they're, they're allocating more to roots early on compared to what they would normally do. And so it's interesting. We see depressed growth. Previous studies by Tubes and others uh, that, you know, measured six, seven, eight-year-old stands on these mine lands back in 1986, they said, oh, the, the trees aren't growing as well. We expect site index to be lower. We expect height growth to be less. But in hindsight, what it looks like was happening, the trees were growing okay. It was just below ground. You couldn't see it. And once they developed that good root system, they went back to doing what they always do. A lot of the soil processes caught back up. We've got good data that shows that on these mines from, from other researchers. And they went back to doing what Lavalle Pine always does. And eventually, they basically caught back up in a productivity standpoint. You've got this few-year lag phase, but then they catch up. So we've, a number of folks have talked about the sleep, then creep, then leap. Well, it looks like with Lavalle Pine on mine lands, it's creep, creep, then creep, then leap, then leap, then leap, then leap. So it's a little bit different growth path. When we look at total productivity on these mine lands, here's again that gonzalez Baniki data. And this now is above ground biomass micrograms per hectare. So we're looking at a whole stand scale, not a per tree scale. All the triangles are Lavalle Pine on non-mine land. All the circles are Lavalle Pine on mine land. We're well within the 95% confidence interval on almost all those points. The light circles down here have less biomass because they've been thin. Which in a stand, you have less total biomass. Next thing we did is we compared these with uh, Dean Coble's data from East Texas on unmined land. And so this is, he's got a great acronym for his study. It's the East Texas Pine Plantation Research Project, or the ETTPRP. So say that five times fast. Um, but if you look, uh, we're looking at height here. This is not all the data on unmined lands. Uh, the way they put out these reports for the non-mined lands it's at age 10, age 20, age 30. So what Jeremy did here is he found the three or four stands he had near age 10, the three or four stands he had near age 20, and the three or four stands he had near age 30. So this is a subset of our whole data. But if you look at height growth, fairly similar results there versus non-mined lands. If you look at quadratic mean diameter, the trees on non-mined lands are larger. This is a density effect. Okay, They tend to be at a lower density than what we're seeing in these unthin plantations in the non-mined data set. And so that's purely a density effect. That's nothing to do with uh, Here's basal area. And again, I think what we're seeing is different management practices uh, in that, that data set that Dean Kobel's put together. It's quote unquote unmanaged pine plantations. They have not been thin. And so you see higher basal areas, but only on unmined land, only at age 20 and 30. And it's because Luminant has started thinning these stands at those ages on mine land. So that, that's why the basal areas are lower. But here again, here's the total volume yield, cubic feet per acre, again, back to English units. And you can see fairly similar product production, particularly at age 30, which is the end of the rotation, which from a timber production standpoint is what we care about. Uh, we looked at Reinegge's stand density index, and I won't go, won't go into this in much detail, but basically what you want to do is you want to keep a pine stand between this line down here, minimum stocking about 33% relative density, and this stand, or sorry, this line right up here, about 45% relative density. Up at this line, about 55, 58% is when you start seeing trees dying from just competition with other trees in the stand and at mortality. And what you see in this data is basically only the young stands are severely understocked, which is what we expect. They haven't hit crown closure yet. They shouldn't be stocked that highly. Everything's over 20% once you get past about age 10. And they do have some stands that are pretty substantially overstocked. Now, you know, the, the, these reclaimed mine lands are regulated. Uh, if the regulator wants 450 trees 
per acre to ensure bond release, uh, the, the managers are going to be pretty conservative with their thinning. Here's some of the mortality by age, and we're seeing some substantial mortality in some of these older stands. These stands weren't on mine land, and there were no regulatory hurdles. Uh, managers would thin these, capture that mortality, um, and put it on a log truck. Um, due to regulatory constraints, there's some issues fairly thin these stands in a timely fashion. So that's something that could be looked at more uh, going forward from a regulatory standpoint. And so in conclusion, as best we can estimate it, these stands seem to be restored to productivity levels similar to pre-mining. They seem to be restored to productivity levels compared to non-mine land. Um, and there's only a slight difference, age 16 to 25 years, versus an average site off of mine lands. But again, these sites were not average to start with. Um, the per tree biomass seems to be greater on mine lands, and we're st still not exactly sure why. It looks like it has something to do with taper, but we don't know why that taper is changing necessarily. The above ground biomass was with, well within the range of lob on non mine lands in the U.S. South, and we saw that interesting effect in Alama tree. So they're changing root shoot ratios early on, but then they return to what lob always does on non mine lands uh, after the first few years. Uh, so this was this was a massive undertaking. Um, Jeremy's Research and his uh, assistantship was funded through Luminance Environmental Research Program. Luminance has been funding research for 40 plus years uh, and have put a lot of students uh, through master's and PhD programs. Jeremy's one of them. Um, Bryant Doherty was Jeremy's field tech. Jason Grogan's our research associate that helped a lot with the below ground destructive harvests. And then we had about 15, 20 student workers that spent a lot of time in a lab pulling needles off of frame, trying to separate all this biomass. 